look forward now to hearing uh, Shashikirana BNG. Uh, Shashikirana BNG holds a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a master's degree in Sanskrit aesthetics. He works as a contributing editor of Preksha, an online journal of Indian culture and philosophy. He is a recipient of the prestigious Sahitya Academy Prize 2021 for translation which he received along with Shatavadhani, Dr. R. Ganesh. For their Sanskrit translation of Devudu Narasimha Shastri's Mahabrahman, which is a Kannada novel. His presentation today is on Chandogati, Unraveling the Beauty of Poetic Meters. Over to you, Shashikaran. Thank you. I hope I am audible. Ah, uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Om Devim Vacha Majanajanta Deva Tam Vishwarupa Pashavo Vadanti Sano Mandre Shamur Janduhana De Nurva Gasmanu Pasuk Putaitu Sarve Bhunamaha. At the outset, I would like to I would like to thank everyone at Indica, Meg Kalyan Sundaramji, Nagaraj Paturiji, Arvind Ayarji, who uh, for having me here. It gives me great pleasure to give this talk on Chandas, a topic that is close to my heart, a topic that is unfortunately not being discussed, not on the internet at any rate, in the manner and uh, in the measure to which it deserves. So I'm happy to be here. Now, the topic of my discussion for today is Chandogati, a remarkable treatise authored in Kannada by Sedi Apu Krishnabhatta. Before going into the topic itself, I have uh, one more thanks to offer, and this is to the speakers who presented before me, specifically to Sri Raghavendra Hebbaluluji and Srimati Srilalita Rupanagudi, because they had aspects from Sadi Apu's work in their talk. They have made my job easier. I shall try to cover some other aspects which they did not have the time to cover in their of the course of their presentation. Now, before going into the topic itself, Chandogati, the treatise, I would like to speak a few words about the author of this remarkable work, Sediapu Krishnabhatta. Sediapu uh, was born in Karnataka. His name was Krishnabhat. Sediapu happens to be the village in which he was born. And he was afflicted by many problems since childhood. He uh, was not a well to do person neither were his parents, they were all very poor. And uh, Sedi Apu had many physical difficulties and problems as well. In fact, he had eye problems to begin with from the time he was a child. And by the time he went, came into his 40s or 50s, he lost his eyesight altogether. So you can only imagine the kind of effort it takes to contemplate on a subject inside his head for years on end, for decades together, and come up with seminal works such as uh, the Chandogati. Of course, Chandogati, he wrote it down uh, with his own hand. Uh, fortunately, he had his eyesight, though it was failing. Other works, he dictated it uh, to his students. And uh, he was a Kannada tutor by profession. Although he was a great scholar, he did not get a job that is commensurate with his prodigious learning because of his failing health and failing eyesight. He was employed as a tutor which meant that he only had to correct the papers written by school children in their examinations. He was not even allowed to teach those students. So that was the pathetic state of affairs of uh, faced by Sedi Apu Krishna Bhatta. He was also an Ayurvedic doctor. He practiced the Ayurveda. He taught uh, the Vidya Ayurveda Vidya to himself. And uh, I will present just one another detail of this fascinating scholar because it is very interesting. Because he did not have many resources at his disposal, he used whatever he had to the fullest extent. He had this small radio with him and he, he used to listen to various stations or various programs that were broadcast in the Akashavani. And he would glean very subtle nuances of all those programs. For instance, if there, uh, if there would be a music pro uh, program that was broadcast, he would glean from that program by hearing or by listening to that program, nuances of pronunciation, how people pronounce similar words across various languages in India. 
how a kannadiga pronounces a word how a telugu person pronounces a particular or the same word how a bengali pronounces and so many other things like that and he had this remarkable penchant for reading dictionaries he had a fascination for vs aptes uh, english and uh, sanskrita dictionary and he had such a remarkable mastery over that text that after he went blind he would when he was looking for a word for instance he would call someone in his house and say uh, he would feel the book and open a particular page and the word he would be looking for he would instruct that person look inside the third column in this particular page you are very likely to find the word there so that is the kind of mastery he enjoyed over even such works such as the dictionaries he was a great master of yakarana or grammar nirukta or the science of etymology sahitya shastra or poetics uh, aesthetics bhasha shastra sanskriti shastra and so on and uh, because like i said he used to contemplate on various topics inside his head and this led him to do manana as our shastrakaras enjoy us to do yukti bhir anachintanam mananam it is said when you understand a particular topic in order to reinforce it for yourself before propagating it for the benefit of others you will have to substantiate it by continuous reasoning by uh, you know thinking about it from various quarters of logical reasoning that is what he used to do and uh, he had these three fundamental tenets for going about any piece of writing so if anyone were to ask him why do you uh, go about writing why have you written this particular piece he used to give out these three particular reasons one is to say something new something which no other person has said about this particular topic and two in order to say in order to um, extend the frontiers of a particular subject or a particular branch of learning and three is to clarify so it is for these three reasons to say something new or extend the frontiers or to clarify he says in so many words durvyakhya vishamurchitan vicharan punas sanjeevayitum iva he says in so many words so that is the high standard that sedyapu set for himself and it is to his credit that he has not written even a single word that has not fall into this standard that does not follow this standard and namulam likhyate kinchin nanapekshita muchyate again the high standard set by mallinatha suri in his vyakhyana so on the panchamaha kavya sedyapu follows the same dictum i shall not say anything that is not based on reasoning that is not based on evidence and nanapekshita muchyate neither shall i say anything that is frivolous or unwanted he has authored several seminal work such as the chandogati which is the subject of our present discussion kannada chandasu is a companion volume to this satya darshana is a remarkable treatise on etymology and uh, uh, it also gives insights into the saraswati river kelavu desha namagalu is a work on etymology vichara prapancha is a collection of his scholarly essays now to come to the subject chandas it would be instructive to understand how various scholars have treated this subject in ancient times and also in modern times so if you look at ancient authors uh, in their treatises written by from pingala all the way to kedara bhatta and even modern authors what we observe is that the ancient authors concerned themselves with lakshya lakshana samanvaya primarily of course they had something some other things to say as well but their primary objective was lakshya lakshana samanvaya what does this mean they had a broad corpus of works before them in the form of lakshyas or examples they had works such as the vedas or even poetic compositions supposedly which are no longer available due to the ravages of time and in order to explain the nature of those compositions they came up with various definitions and they went about doing various iterations in order to match the lakshana perfectly to the lakshya and if it would not match they would go on refining the lakshana further and further so that it would be free from any flaws such as avyapti ativyapti etc so this was the case with the ancients now how have the modern scholars gone about um, treating this subject it is in two ways one is aitihasika adhyayana and the two is ganitiya adhyayana we see these two broad categories in their approach to the subject because they have the privilege of accessing such a huge body of literature that is passed on from centuries handed down to them by their tradition 
they analyze this subject from a historical perspective which scholar has used this particular meter in which work for the first time and ganitiya adhyayana which scholar has used this meter how many times it also gives an insight into the predilections of the poet as to various chandas as to the employment of various poetic meters and uh, uh, by using technological tools especially in times like of ours in the 21st century people have also done statistical analysis and have come up with fascinating tools now be that as it may in all these fields of study we see there is a lacuna in that chanda saundarya mimamsa unraveling the beauty of poetic meters has not been taken up adequately of course scholars ancient scholars such as uh, um, jayakirti or uh, such as kshemendra particularly or even bhojadeva passingly in his work such as shringara prakasha or saraswati kantha bharana have had some interesting things to say about chanda saundarya but it is not done in an adequate manner even modern scholars such as hd velankar madhusudan shastri ojha have concerned themselves with this subject now chandas broadly speaking can be classified into three major aspects one is vrutta matra jati and the third one is karshana jati or karnata vishaya jati uh, shri lalita ji and uh, raghavendra hebbalulu ji have already explained to all of you the lakshanas of all these three terms and uh, sedi apu to his credit has dealt with all these three aspects in his two volumes one is the chandogati and the other is kannada chandas so in chandogati he discusses vrutta and matra jati and in his other work kannada chandasu he discusses karshana jati or karnata vishaya jati of which the examples include um, sangatya tripadi and so on so he does this in tandem with sangeeta shastra so chanda shastra and sangeeta shastra are termed as samana tantra in our tradition so sedi apu while analyzing chandas draws parallels from sangeeta shastra utilizes uses those concepts from sangeeta shastra and even refers to seminal treatises of musicology such as sangeeta ratnakara authored by sharanga deva and he uh, comes up with fascinating discoveries within the ambit of chanda shastra itself and to come to this particular work without uh, further ado chandogati it has nine parichedas or nine chapters and the work is so structured it is structured as uh, a scientific treatise or even as a mathematical treatise in that the author presents a hypothesis up front and he adduces evidence for the hypothesis at every step takes you together with him uh, reasons out and arrives at a result or a conclusion so a result or a conclusion is not presented up front as would be in a scientific treatise but a hypothesis is presented and the author takes you on a tour of reasoning so it is a very fascinating read and also you should read the text from one part to the next you cannot skip the first part and even try to understand the next it won't work that way so if you try to read the chapter 7 without having read the chapter 6 chances are that you will find a naughty portion and you won't understand it so this is how the text is structured and he cites examples from various authorities of the tradition such as the amarakosha with the sudha vyakhyana jayakirti his work chando anushasana and of course from pingala sutra and the commentary there on written by halayudha sangeeta ratna kana like i just said and he uh, staying true to the standards he has set for himself he clarifies many portion within the shastra as well so what are the contents of this work i shall briefly read out many of the subjects that he has dealt with because of paucity of time i might not have the opportunity to go into everything in detail laya tala vrutta jati the definition of the word chandas itself the difference between laya which is a bharatiya word and rhythm which is a western word uh, people were using it without um, without adequate discretion and sediapu clarifies the meaning of those two words gati the word chandogati and satana meters pitana meters like takvendra hebbalulu explained and akshara gatis and uh, as discussed in various musicological treatises the various avarta gatis in that the matra bandhas have ganas which repeat and uh, to them sediapu gives the name avarta gati and he discusses various poetic meters such as dhanushtop upajati udgata arya geeti and so on 
what is the lakshana of the term padya and yati which is a poetic pause or sesura chanda padagati bhasha padagati he comes up with many such new paribhasha himself so let us uh, look at a few of these concepts and try to understand sediapu takes up the word chandas for discussion in one place in the work and what is the primary meaning of this very ancient word now we know that the word chandas can mean the vedas the vedas themselves are called chandas it also can mean one of the limbs of the vedas a vedanga vedangam shastram api chandaha and it can also mean a verse a poetic verse padya bandha vishesha so among all these meanings there are other meanings as well what is the primary meaning because we are trying to evolve a shastra out of it we will have to have very clear understanding of the word itself so sediapu comes up with this ingenious explanation the meaning itself was known to us but the explanation is very uh, definitive he says that a sequence of lagus and gurus or a sequence of short and long syllables that is the primary meaning of the word chandas why he gives this very um, gr- uh, very good example he says take any three words that have the same number of letters and have the same number of matras i'm sure all of you know what a matra is it is a syllabic instant he takes three words such as ganesha madhava and kuchela if you observe all these three words have the same number of letters three three letters in all these three words and also the number of matras is also the same five matras in ganesha madhava and kuchela there are three letters and five matras then what accounts for their difference the uh, what accounts for their difference is the sequence of lagus and gurus in ganesha like you can see it is lagu guru guru in madhava it is guru lagu guru and so on madhava that is why it is guru lagu and guru and so on so this is the clinching evidence to settle the meaning of the word chandas and he goes on to define the word gati as well because the uh, title of his work is chando gati he has to define all those words that are form components of the title of his work and he defines gati as akarshika chandas sarani so chandas sarani is the sequence of short and long syllables like as i said and it is not just any sequence but it is a captivating it is a riveting it is an arresting it is a beautiful sequence of lagus and gurus akarshika chandas sarani and he comes up with a further refinement of that definition he says but this akarshakatva can be seen in prose as well let me give you an example in bodhiraja's champu ramayana we have very beautiful prose passages as well in the balakanda itself when chandra was tormented by ravana the poet writes a very beautiful passage esha mrugaṁ kopi agayaya sa parishranti vishranti sa sambhraman namajjana parivrute majjana griha abhimukhe dasha mukhe tatratya vichitratara shata kumbha sambha sambhagra pratyagra pratyukta sphatika shila sala bhanjika punja karatala kalita nijopalamaya kalasha mukha dachacham avichinna dhara mambudharam nijakara abhimarsha dapadayam tatra prasada pishunanam shunasira chirakankshitanam vimshati vidha vikshananam kshana matram patram bhavati now as soon as hearing this prose passage one is obviously led to the conclusion that there is something captivating in it but there is not a regular pattern of lagus and gurus there is not a regular pattern of short and long syllables whereas if you hear a meter such as shardula vikridita paravara payo vishoshana kala parina kala nalajwala jala vihara hari vishikha vyapara ghora kramah from vedanta deshikas work you will notice that there is a repeated pattern there is a regularly discernible pattern of lagus and gurus and he says aniyata gati hi gadyasya lakshanam niyata gati hi padyasya lakshanam if there is a repeated if there is a, a definite pattern of lagus and gurus within the ambit of a poetic meter then that is called as a padya if there is not it is called as a gadya so this the fascinating aspect of this work is as soon as you hear an explanation for a concept you will understand it and it will seem obvious but it is not so obvious because the entire tradition had not explained these concepts so beautifully and he goes on to explain words such as vritta and jati as well raghavendra hikbalulu mentioned this verse 
पद्यं चतुष्पदम ज्ञेयम वृत्तं जा तेरी विधा एक देश स्थिरा जा तेरी वृत्तम गुरु लघु स्थिरम दिस इज एन एंशियंट वर्स एंड दिस हैड अ पाठ भेदा और अ टेक्स्टुअल रिसेंशन डिफिकल्टी इन इट्स अंडरस्टैंडिंग बट सेरिया पुसेस सिरा इज द एक्चुअल पाठ एंड ही गोस ऑन टू से पद्य इज और अ वृत्ता इज वन इन विच देयर इज अ सर्वदेश स्थिरत्व व्हाट डज दिस मीन एज ऑल ऑफ अस नो अ टिपिकल संस्कृत meter has four feet to it and each foot has various uh, gurus and lagus and if all the four feet have the same number of letters and a regular pattern of this short and long syllables then it is um, it can be called as vritta if not it can be called as jati and in order to explain jati as well sediapu uh, employs modern so called modern scientific concepts such as genus and species he says these are fascinating concepts and i don't think i have the time to go into them but mind you sediapu was not educated in the modern system as we know it today but his scientific mind innately or inadvertently came up with this concepts so uh, to put it very briefly jati or a genus is something in which it is a group in which objects of similar characteristics are put together for ease of analysis and within the jati there are various species so there are various vyaktis and uh, he goes on to say so uh, the examples are may any in number um, jati and uh, vyakti i will not go into it but the fascinating aspect of it is even a popular meter such as anushtup and upajati can be classified under these jatis like akshara jati sediapu comes up with the same name because the uh, definition of anushtup panchamam lagu sarvatra it is inadequate it does not explain all the characteristic traits of the anushtup completely so he comes up with a new classification akshara jati for it and uh, he goes on to classify gati because he has defined it as ak- akarshika chandasaranihi he goes on to classify it as druta vilambita and madhyama he does not do it for the first time he has borrowed this concept from various predecessors and he says lagu bahala gatihi druta if there is a string of only short syllables then that particular gati is called as druta in that it appears to be very swift if there is a string of long syllables then that is called as vilambita because that appears to be long drawn out if there is a mixture of it if there is an admixture of long and short syllables then that is called as madhyama gati and using these concepts he defines the term yati or sesura or poetic pause now yati is a concept that is pivotal to chanda shastra and all our shastrakaras starting from pingala had defined yati as a virama as a pause within the ambit of a poetic or a metrical within the ambit of a poetic meter but why why do we stop virama yatir virama yatir vichheda these are some of the definitions given out by pingala and many other shastrakaras like him but why is there a need to stop within the ambit of a meter sedia po says i will give you a very uh famous example i will take just a single line of the poetic meter manda akranta shanta karam bhujaga shayanam padmanabham suresham shanta karam bhujaga shayanam padmanabham suresham if you see the scansion of this particular line scansion refers to the arrangement of lagus and gurus within the particular line you can see that in the four letters at the beginning shanta karam we have only long syllables and in the following six letters bhujaga shayanam the five are lagus or short syllables followed by a guru and in the third half padmanabham suresham we have an admixture of lagus and gurus with the predominance of guru syllables there as well na 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 it is there now keep this example in mind and see the explanation that sedi apu comes up with he comes up with two terms one he says it is called chandav padagati and the other is called bhasha padagati so any poetic meter if not manda akranta or any other poetic meter has an innate or inherent rhythm to it regardless of meaningful words being used within that poetic meter it has a rhythm of its own that is called as chandav padagati so in the particular example if you say instead of shanta akaram bhujaga shayanam if you say the verse if you refer to the verse kaschit kanta viraha guruna swadhikara pramatta or hartum kumbhe vinihita kar swadu hayangavinam or any such verse composed in the same meter regardless of it 
the structure of mandakranta remains the same which is nana 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 na it has 17 syllables within each foot of this meter and if you go on repeating this uh, pattern of lagus and gurus and he says it is uh, it, it it is beneficial to employ a single syllable a monosyllable such as na in order to recite the meter aloud and discern the yati for yourself na 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 if you go on repeating this and if your ears are attuned to the poetic rhythm you will figure it out for yourself even if nobody explains the concept to you that after the four letters there is a pause why because there is a change in the gati in the four letters like i said there is a predominance of gurus there are only guru aksharas that is the vilambita gati in the next part there is the druta gati na 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 lagu bahulya that is there is a predominance of the short syllables so when different gatis meet then there this yati the concept of yati comes why is there a stop why is there a poetic pause because various gatis or various poetic rhythms meet in that particular point this was the ingenious definition that stadia pukrishna bhatta came up with and this can be applied across all poetic meters and yati is also applicable to matra jatis not just uh, vrittas and uh, in the case of bhasha padagati it is important to pronounce the first letter of all the meaningful words in a much more accentuated manner in a more pronounced manner for instance if you say shantakaram is a single word the first letter is sha so you will have to pronounce that letter sha in a much more pronounced manner in contrast with all the letters so shantakaram bhujaga shayanam padmanabham suresham there is phutatarochara as sedia ko calls it so that is important and when there is a yati bhanga what does it mean what does yati bhanga mean yati bhanga is taken up as a blemish both in chanda shastra and in alankara shastra aestheticians also count yati bhanga or bhagna yati as a poetic blemish or a or a kavya dosha even in chanda shastra it is counted as a blemish why is it so what accounts for this poetic blemish it is because there is a uh, the mixture of chanda padagati and bhasha padagati is not harmonious because the meter has an inherent rhythm of its own and because the poet drawing from his poetic talent goes on arranging one word after another within that poetic meter the two have some dissonance the two exhibit some dissonance that is why there is a chando bhanga or yati bhanga i will give you just one example i will just recite one line i won't go into the whole verse vidya vastu samruddhi ritya khila samagri samete sada or i will give you a better example from bhartrahari uh, niti shataka it is uh, um uh, it is from the poetic meter uh, prithvi uh, it says labheta sikatasu tailam api yatnata peeditum labheta sikatasu tai lam api yatnata peeditum there is a poetic stop there pause there but the it has not been followed by that meter the yati the fixation or the conclusive uh, pause in the within the prithvi meter is a fascinating subject by and of itself the yati got fixed by the time of shila aditya harsha vardhana it was not fixed by the time of bhakta hari and that is why we observe this yati bhanga and uh, sediapu comes up with other fascinating concepts as well such as laya vritta and avarta gatis and so on like raghavendra hebbalalu mentioned in the ambit of his talk why do we see a predominance of meters such as anushtup or vasanta tilaka or shardula vikrita or some such meters it is because they are attuned to the natural linguistic rhythm of sanskrit if you take if you observe the sanskrit language for example the uh, the natural linguistic rhythm of sanskrit is the madhyama akshara gati madhyama akshara gati and the meters which uh, provide room for this madhyama akshara gati they are best suited to express this language and sedia pu explains concepts such as laya and tala in a very fascinating manner which is applicable both to sangeeta shastra and chandas shastra uh, he goes on to the etymology of the word laya uh, the dhatu mula ling shleshane it means dissolution 
what accounts for the dissolution sadi apo explains in this verse and uh, i cannot stop this talk i cannot conclude this talk without referring to sadi apo's explanation of the vaidika chandas so he says the lakshana the uh, preeminent characteristic trait of vedic chandas it was thought to be the traisvarya or udata anudata swarita the three accents in which the veda is recited agnimi ile purohitam yagnasya deva vritvijam ota aram ratta dhata mam you can see the various accents in it scholars had uh, come to the conclusion that this traisvarya is a fundamental characteristic trait of vedika chandas whereas sedyapu says it is not it is the madhyama akshara gati which is a characteristic feature why it is because vedas have portions of prose also in them whereas verse is said to be chandas we only say verse as chandas although we gave the name chandas to veda also but for vyavartakatva for pradhanyena vyapadesha bhavanti iti hetoha we restrict the meaning of the word chandas to padyas alone so sedyapu came up with this clinching evidence that since veda contains prose elements prose passages as well it would be indecorous or it would not be correct at any rate to say that traisvarya it is also there in prose passages because even if you see in rudra adhyaya there are prose passages and those prose passages have to be recited with uh, udatta anudatta swarita those patterns as well so it is not traisvarya but the madhyama akshara gati which is the characteristic trait of the vedika bhasha and uh, he has many other pa- things to say about tantri laya about tanaswarupa about a poetic meter called as raghata how it evolved from the marathi language and uh, it would be uh, very interesting for us to note that sedyapu when he set out to write this work he only wanted to clarify the meaning between the distinction between laya and rhythm but when he put pen to paper and when his thoughts evolved this book uh, came out as a result and uh, the trika vyavastha why has pingala made his ganav vyavastha yamata rajabhana salagam like jss murthy ji explained why are there only three uh, uh, you know aksharas or ganas in all those three ganas we only see there are three elements to it why is it so why are there no more letters why are there no less letters so we have many fascinating topics such as this i hope i have given you a flavor of this work and it is an invitation to read the work in the original i once again extend my thanks to everyone at the indica and all the listeners of this talk as well namaskar what a fascinating what a fascinating talk shashi kiran ji uh, it was mesmerizing and at one level i wish it didn't finish and we hope to have you back uh, to expound more on some of the aspects that you would have liked to uh, cover further and also uh on dot again uh, that's wonderful uh, who said indians don't maintain time we do and we can do it really well